It's good to see you. Um, maybe you would uh, pray with me. Lord God, um, we ask that, that that prophecy in Zechariah would be true of us, that you would be a wall of fire around us, and you would be the glory in our midst. We ask that you would preach, Lord Jesus. Amen. No! Harry, no! Don't look at the light! I can't help it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I love that. I think God is um, kind of like a, a bug zapper. And uh, the temple was definitely like a, a bug zapper, and, and God was the fire in its midst. You may remember that in Exodus chapter 24, God comes down on Mount, uh, on Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, as this like amazing, glorious, consuming fire. And all the people are commanded to stay away from the mountain lest they be consumed, literally eaten. And God commands them to build this tent, which the Bible, we use most versions say a tabernacle, that eventually becomes the stone temple. And in the inner sanctuary, they were to place the Ark of the Covenant, which, as we've talked about, was a coffin for the law with a seat for mercy on top of the coffin where the Lord would appear between the cherubim, like the cherubim that guarded the way to the tree of life. Pretty cool. In Exodus chapter 40, the glory of the Lord, which was like this fiery pillar of flaming cloud, it fills the tabernacle. It was so uh, absolutely awesome, glorious, and, and just beautiful, this cloud around and filling. The, it was like a giant bug zapper. No one could enter. But at its entrance, the priests would make uh, sacrifices in the holy fire, the holy fire that had descended from above and set the altar on fire. When two sons of Levi, uh, Nadab and Abihu, uh, use unauthorized fire at the entrance to the tabernacle, the holy fire breaks out upon them and it consumes them. It, it's more commonly translated eats them. It literally eats them. Like, you know, like you eat a cheeseburger in order to make that cheeseburger part of your, your body. When Solomon finally builds the temple and the priests place the ark in the inner sanctuary, the fire falls on the temple. The priests cannot stand. In Isaiah 33, uh, the people of Jerusalem cry out, and I quote, Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with the everlasting burnings? It's ironic because the, the fire of God that would rest on the ark had saved Israel and yet Israel wanted to be saved from the fire. Well, several years before God came down in Exodus 24 on the top of Mount Sinai, an old shepherd was herding his in-law's sheep on the side of that very same mountain. Herding sheep just like he had done day after day after day for like 40 boring years. Years, 40 years herding his in-laws sheep when we read the following, Exodus chapter 2, verse 2. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning and yet it was not consumed. And he said, I'll turn aside and see this amazing, great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord, when Yahweh saw that he turned to see, and I find it interesting that the Lord saw that this shepherd saw and thought that what he saw was a, a great sight. So, so what did he see? Well, the angel of Yahweh, who as we've recently learned in Genesis, is Yahweh, and the word of Yahweh, and somehow a man, this God-man appears in a, in a bush, Sena, Sena in Hebrew, 
It's a word that only appears in this reference and in one other place in reference to the very uh, same bush, shrub, or tree. In the New Testament, Jesus refers to this bush with the Greek word batos, which means something like thorn, thorn bush. In another place, he refers to the batos as a type of dendron, which is translated as tree, which is also a reference to the cross. So, so anyway, he sees something like a man in a thorn bush or on a thorn tree that's on fire. And neither the man nor the tree is um, consumed by the consuming fire. It's like he sees a bug in a bug zapper and the bug just won't die. A talking, a talking bug. Verse 4, when the Lord Yahweh saw that the shepherd turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Now, as you know, Moses didn't get burned up, and yet in another way, maybe he did get burned up, and I think the burning probably started like 40 years before. The story of Moses in Exodus um, immediately follows the story of Joseph at the end of Genesis, which we talked about last week. It seems that we ought to, to notice that Joseph was a shepherd, and shepherds were despised by the Egyptians. They, they were trash to Egyptians. Joseph was a shepherd that became a prince of Egypt and so saved Israel. Moses was a prince of Egypt that became a shepherd and so saved Israel. <laughs> And you notice their stories are like the exact opposite of each other, and yet in another way they are exactly the same. You know, whenever something appears to be a success, we usually try to turn it into a map, right? So how, how do you save Israel? Well, number one, you have a dream. Number two, you get sold into slavery by your brothers. Uh, number three, you get accused of rape. Number four, you answer the call from Pharaoh, and so you save Israel. That's how you see. We turn it into a map. We always want to turn it into a map, and, and there is no map. But only the constant decision that is actually a very strange decision called faith. It actually doesn't matter if you're a shepherd or a prince, but if you want to save Israel, you have to believe that God is salvation, and you are not. Genesis and Exodus are both volumes of one book, really, called the Pentateuch, which means kind of like the five books, but one piece of work. But between the end of Genesis and the start of Exodus, there's this unrecorded span of about 400 years. Unrecorded except for the news that the new king of Egypt has forgotten about Joseph. The children of Israel multiplied greatly, and in fear, the Egyptians had enslaved the Israelites and now instituted a plan of killing their firstborn sons. Some people, you know, think that the Bible is like nonstop miracle stories. But think about that. It had been 400 years. That's like 1623. Do you know what happened on this day in 1623? I have no idea. 400 years since any recorded signs, wonders, or dreams. And then in Exodus 2, um, a woman, a woman puts her baby in a little boat made of reeds and pitch and then hides that baby down in the reeds by the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds the infant, hires the, the mother of the baby to nurse the baby, and then she raises him as her own son, literally the grandson then of Pharaoh. According to Acts chapter 7, he's, quote, instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and becomes, quote, mighty in words and deeds, but he's obviously conflicted. At the age of 40, he visits his people as they labor for the Egyptians. When he sees one of them being oppressed, he comes to the Hebrews' defense and he ends up killing the Egyptian, which is kind of a confusing concept because a lot of Egyptians are going to die. In the book of Acts, Stephen claims that this man Moses assumed that the Israelites would understand that through him, quote, God was saving them. So Moses 
had a Messiah complex. He'd undoubtedly heard of Jacob and Joseph's dreams, right? And he wanted to make the dream happen. You've been blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the, of the world. That's the word that came to Abraham, and he wanted to make it happen. He had undoubtedly felt the fire, and he wanted to make salvation happen. He wanted to make freedom. He wanted to make freedom happen, and so he tried to free Israel, children of Israel. He had a Messiah complex. Webster's defines a Messiah complex as a group of repressed desires and memories that exerts a dominating influence upon the personality. The Oxford Dictionary refers to it as a related group of emotionally significant ideas, significant ideas that shapes the personality. So Moses felt the wounds of 400 years, and he dreamed the repressed dreams of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he looked at himself and his situation where he found himself, and of course he had a Messiah complex. Who better to save Israel? Number one, I am obviously the man for the job. Who else could be better? Number two, I have or I will have a plan I'm educated, quote, in all the wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians. Number three, I got the tools. Prince of Egypt. Literally mighty in words and deeds. But in a moment of passion, he kills an Egyptian. But some Israelites see it, and they don't trust Moses. They don't understand. They fear Moses. And when the Pharaoh, probably now his cousin, or maybe even his brother, finds out, he issues a death sentence. Moses had a Messiah complex, and it didn't go very well. <laughs> they, they rarely do. I can't tell you the number of people I've known that have felt the fire, then felt responsible for the fire, and then were driven mad by their own knowledge of the fire. Or maybe burned by the fire. One pastor friend asphyxiated himself. Another pastor friend hung himself. Many have suffered from addictions, mental illness, crippling anxiety. The first two senior pastors that I served had multiple affairs and destroyed their marriages. And yet I know, I know that at one time they definitely dreamed the dream. And they felt the fire of faithful love. You know, I really struggle with my own inability to save people. I mean, I've seen God seriously do absolutely amazing things, even in response, it seems, to my own prayers. But then at other times, it feels like I can do nothing, absolutely nothing, and it just about drives me insane. Well, apparently, nothing is more dangerous than a Messiah complex. I mean, is there anything that has led to more violence and death and destruction in our world? Hitler had a Messiah complex. I think Judas had a Messiah complex. That's why he had a problem with the Messiah. Maybe you have a Messiah complex. Are there people that you think you need to save, can save, or maybe will save. Could be your children, husband, wife, friends. I mean, maybe you have a Messiah complex. Some people actually think that they can use knowledge of God to save people from God, including themselves. And that sounds a little familiar to me. Which would mean that I have a Messiah complex and I am the victim of a false Messiah. An imitation Christ, an antichrist. I am a victim of me. (laughs) Victim of me. Fifteen years ago, I felt the fire, and I dreamed the dream. Blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. I, I knew that people needed to be freed from lies about the character of our Father in heaven, and I thought, I'm the man for the job. Number one, I grew up in the church, prince of the church. 
Number two, I had a plan, a large church, book contracts, and a dominant voice in my denomination. Number three, I had the tools. I mean, I saw things, I educated, I saw things in Scripture, I knew other people weren't seeing it, and, and I had all the connections to people in power. In other words, I had all my ducks in a row. When I was put on trial and told to confess that number one, God couldn't save all, and number two, God didn't want to save all. And when I refused to confess, they gave me a week to recant. And I didn't. Some people said that I had a Messiah complex. I've honestly been wrestling with that inside for 15 years. And you see, I think I, I did. And I still do. That's why I get depressed. <laughs> and I get stressed. And I care so much when crowds shrink and people leave the church. I do have a Messiah complex. But I don't think it fully explains why I did not recant. But maybe it explains just the opposite. Why I would want to recant. Why I would still want to be the prince of the church. Why I would still want to have all the plans and all the tools. Well, Pharaoh, Pharaoh sentences Moses to death. And Moses flees to the wilderness. It sounds like a terrible thing, but maybe it's the very best thing. Because you see, for the very first time, Moses is free, right? But I doubt he felt very free. You know, like on the Commercials for personal products or whatever. <laughs> he must have still longed for Egypt. Well, in Midian, he meets a woman, marries her, and, and Moses is, Exodus 2, verse 22, now I quote, he's content. He's content to dwell with his father-in-law and herd his flock for 40 years. Moses is 80 years old when he turns to see the one in the consuming fire that is not consumed, and then he hears his voice, chapter 3, verse 6. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now I'm sure that Moses is utterly bewildered, right? But at some point, he's got to be thinking, you can't be serious. And where the hell have you been? It's been 400 years, and you're sending me? Now? Now? I used to be the man for the job. I used to have a plan. I used to have all the tools. Maybe God is calling you to something. He's at least calling you, and at most calling you, at least he's calling you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and he's calling you to love your neighbor as yourself. How are you going to do that? Maybe God has gotten more specific with the calling, and you think, well, I used to be the one for the job. I used to have a plan. I used to have all the tools. But seriously, now I'll just look like a fool. My old friend Bob Belts used to lead men's retreats where he would refer to this chart that I think came from Richard Rohr, if I'm not mistaken. But he used to say that men spend the first period of their life, perhaps 17 years, maybe, 40, maybe 46 years, making an ascent like this. They build, their, they build their lives until they have a crisis, an identity crisis. They come face to face with their own mortality. You will die. Some men don't get the message, in which case they keep building 
their life. They, they build bigger barns in order to store more of their things for themselves. And we call them successful if they do that. But apparently, according to Jesus' story in Luke 12, God refers to them as old fools. Bob would say that most men cannot continue the ascent. But, but they, still, they still try and they still don't get the message, in which case they become bitter old men. <laughs> but some make a descent, a spiritual descent, and they become holy fools. Soren Kierkegaard wrote this, God created everything out of nothing, and everything which God is to use, he first reduces to nothing. St. Paul wrote, if anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. And of course, in this age, I think I'm rather wise for quoting that verse, don't you think? <laughs> but in Exodus 3, old Moses has taken off his shoes. He's standing on holy ground, the edge of this age and God's age, and yet he's got to be thinking, are you kidding me? I was the man for the job. I, I did have a plan. And once upon a time, I had all the tools. I was a man for the job, but now I'm just a fool. I was the right guy, but now you got the wrong guy. Verse 10, come, I will send you to Pharaoh, says the Lord, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, but I will be with you. The issue is not who... I am, but who I am is. I will be with you, and this shall be, I love this, this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. I love that. Hey, Moses, you want a sign it was me? Well, after you go, then you will know. <laughs> but if you want to know, you're going to have to go. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people, the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And I'm sure Moses thought, well, that really clears things up. But you see, God cannot be proven or defined with human words. Why? Because it's his word that defines and proves everything else. Everything that's anything. He cannot be defined by us, but something in us can recognize him. We know him because he has known us. He created us. He's like the collective consciousness in our collective unconsciousness. The consciousness in our collective unconsciousness. I mean the light, the truth, the life, the love in our world. And, and the good in our history, right? Our forefathers and foremothers. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise... I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. I promise. That's an unconditional promise and rather surprising if you know the rest of the story, right? Verse 18, and they will listen to your voice and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to them, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us and now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. Then Moses answered, um, look God, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. In other words, I used to be the right guy, but now you got the wrong guy. I used to have the right plan, but this is the wrong plan. They used to listen to me. They're not going to listen to me now. I used to have the right equipment, but now I got no equipment, no tools. I used to have Egypt. I had the armies of Egypt. I had the Pharaoh in my hand. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. 
Do you know what a staff is? It's a big stick. A stick? (laughs) And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand, caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe, believe the latter sign. Then he gives them a few more signs. Verse 10, but Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, either in the past or since, since you've spoken to your servants, since right now, I guess. But I'm slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute? That's a fascinating question. Who makes him deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. You don't know what to speak now. I will teach you what to speak. I'm with you. There's an old story about a master violinist who played a Stradivarius. The music was just wonder, glory, fire, beauty. People would whisper, just listen to that Stradivarius. Eventually the maestro had had enough. He bought a rickety old $5 fiddle. Then on the night that he was to play the greatest concert of his life, he pulled out that $5 fiddle. On that fiddle, he played his greatest work and everybody whispered, what a Stradivarius. So was Moses an old fiddle, or a Stradivarius, or both? And is it the instrument that makes the music, or is it the music that makes the instrument, the music of God, the Word of God, the logic of God, the emotion of God, like we talked about last week? See, I don't think God has ego needs. He doesn't need to prove himself to himself. He doesn't have... He doesn't have ego needs, like his ego needs to get the glory. God doesn't have ego needs unless, of course, that ego need is is you. Your fallen ego is pretty needy. And maybe he wants to give to you his glory. Maybe he doesn't need to know that you love him so much as he needs you to know that he loves you so you might surrender to his music and his music is fire. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord. Verse 12, now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh my Lord, please send somebody else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against, literally, it burned Moses. And remember, Moses is still standing in front of this burning God man in a bush on a tree, burning but not burnt. But now, Moses begins to burn. The word of God is the fire of God, which Moses now feels as the anger of God. He's like a bug caught in the bug zapper of God. Hey, I brought my uh, car battery from my truck. It's full of energy. And energy, you know, is uh, like fire. Fire is energy. And like Moses, I do feel slow of speech. And, And I think I'm called to speak what God tells me to speak. And so I need to tap into the into the fire so I brought this along for that for that purpose see here I just have to hook it up like this and and there's and there's fire see see that pretty cool so all I have to do you see is if I just hook this one to one lip gotta lick them one one lip and and one to the other then but maybe not. (laughs) 
And, and why not? I'll, I'll undo this just so you aren't nervous. Why, why not? <laughs> well, because I'd burn up. I mean, I would literally be burned. And why would I be burned? Well, because human flesh is a bad conductor of electricity. In other words, it's resistant to the energy in, 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 in those copper wires. And yet that's amazing because if I was a copper wire, a little, just a little copper wire, I wouldn't burn at all. In fact, those jumper cables are made out of copper and, and they don't burn at all and yet they, they have enough power to start the car every, every morning because they're not resistant to the, the energy in, in those cables. Copper wire is a good conductor of energy. And what is the energy? <laughs> what is the emotion behind all motion? What is the prime mover? <laughs> Do you see it? I think this is the burning bush, the burning thorn tree. Last week we said that the God-man, who is the Word, who is the fire, hanging on this tree in the middle of this garden at the edge of this age and God's age, we, we said that he's the logic of love, the emotion behind all motion. He is love in flesh, and he is free. Free love, love that just moves wherever it will, free love is, is grace. Deuteronomy 33, speaking of Joseph, Moses says, Blessed by the Lord be his land, Joseph's land, with the favor, literally the grace, of the one who dwells in the bush. That's the other place that the word's used, the one other place in the Bible. Translated thorn bush, thorn tree. So you see, it's grace that inhabits the bush. Free love is grace, grace that creates faith, which is the decision, the judgment that brings us home and testifies that God is salvation. Jesus literally is God is salvation. That's what his name means. God is salvation. That's his name. He's the Messiah. What could be more resistant to the Messiah than a Messiah complex <laughs> in you? When Moses was 40, he thought he was the Messiah, and so he was unable to save anyone. He had a Messiah complex. When Moses was 80, he thought that he was unable to save anyone. He thought that he was unable to save anyone because he had not been able to make himself into the Messiah. He still had a Messiah complex. Whether it's arrogance or shame, it's still a Messiah complex. If you think that you have to make yourself into the Messiah. How can I testify to the Messiah if I believe that I am the Messiah or must make myself into the Messiah? How can I testify to Jesus, who is literally God is salvation, if I believe that I am salvation or that I must somehow become salvation or be salvation, make myself salvation? How can I testify to God as salvation if I believe that I must save myself by like taking knowledge from Jesus to create myself in the image of Jesus? That's not testifying to the life of Jesus, but the death of Jesus. How can I testify to God as salvation when with my anxiety, shame, and fear I testify that, well, God really actually isn't salvation? And love really actually isn't free. It's not grace. So we can quote all the verses, we can make all of the arguments, and then with our fear, shame, unforgiveness, self-centeredness, testify that God is not salvation. For, in fact, we are salvation, and in fact, we need to save ourselves from God. In other words, it's all about us. Several years ago, Rick Joyner uh, claims to have had an encounter with the glory of God, and that at one point he cried out, I feel so small. And then this is from his book, the, I think that's The Call. He cried out, I feel so small. You are small, he heard in reply. But you must learn to abide in my presence without looking at yourself. 
You will not be able to hear from me or speak for me if you are looking at yourself. You will always be inadequate. You will always be unworthy for what I call you to do, but it will never be your adequacy or worthiness that causes me to use you. You must not look at your inadequacy, but look to my adequacy. You must stop looking at your own unworthiness and look to my righteousness. When you are used, it is because of who I am, not who you are. You did feel my anger as you began to look at yourself. This is the anger I felt toward Moses when he started to complain about how inadequate he was. This only reveals that you are looking to yourself more than to me. This false humility is actually a form of the pride that caused the fall of man. Adam and Eve began to feel inadequate and that they needed to be more than I had made them to be. They took it upon themselves to make themselves into who they should be. You can never make yourself into who you should be, but you must trust me to make you into who you should be. Well, who do you suppose that we should be? How about the image and likeness of God? Who is salvation? Well, as I was saying, Moses began to burn. Or part of Moses began to burn, but not all of Moses burned. Perhaps part of Moses uh, was uh, already burned up and part of Moses couldn't burn, or maybe there was still more of Moses to be burned. Whatever the case, God actually relents. He says, okay, Moses, I'll let Aaron, your 83-year-old brother, he'll do, the, he'll do the talking. And then in verse 16, he shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be uh, your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Exodus 7, 1. Now in Egypt, after Moses once again complained to God you know, about his inadequacy, God says this to Moses. Listen closely. See, I have made you like God, to Pharaoh. Moses, Moses, Moses cannot make himself like God. But it seems that God can make Moses like himself. And yet Scripture says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Isn't that something? Meekest man on the face of the world. You see, he was, he was like a little copper wire. Meekest man on the face of the earth. And yet, through whom has God ever exhibited more firepower than Moses? I mean, Moses literally calls down fire from heaven upon Egypt. He literally follows a pillar of fire out into the wilderness and then up on to a mountain. But, but now an entire nation is following Moses. He spoke face to face with the fire on the mountain and the fire that would rest on top of the ark uh, between the cherubim in the tabernacle. And you may remember this, that uh, when he did that or when he would do that, um, that uh, he would put a veil over his face. And this is interesting, the same word as the veil that would be put over the mercy seat in the temple. He put a veil over his face so as not to scare the people. Why? Because he was glowing. It was like a burning bush, a walking, talking, burning bush. Burning and not burnt. And yet there was still more to burn. Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt, but you see, more than Egypt, they needed to be freed from themselves. In fact, Moses still needed to be freed from himself. One day he struck the rock in anger. Remember the rock from which God had previously had them draw water. St. Paul tells us that the rock that followed them was Christ. Moses, you see, still had a bit of a Messiah complex. We all still have a bit of a Messiah complex. Original sin is the Messiah complex. Moses struck the rock and God sentenced him to death in the wilderness, literally in sight of the promised land. <laughs> he sunk into Sheol, also translated hell. And yet Exodus 3.17, we read it, God had given him an unconditional promise. Moses is not seen again. Until 1,500 years later, he shows up on a mountain in the promised land talking to the God-man whose face is shining like the sun. Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah, quote, 
appeared with him in glory. They looked like the Messiah on fire. You see, Moses had a Messiah complex, but far more consequentially, the Messiah had a Moses complex. <laughs> you know, I think he has a you complex. He actually thinks that he's you. And you are like his body. Even though you disagree every day and say, nope, this is my body. I'm in charge of my body. I'm not going to sacrifice my body. Moses couldn't make himself the Messiah, but the Messiah was always making himself Moses and making Moses himself. We are the Messiah's complex. Fifteen years ago, I was sitting in a hotel room at a retreat in Michigan, listening to this gal talk about Exodus 1 through 4, the verses that we looked at today. She was pointing out that after Moses originally fled from Egypt, he named his son Goshen, which means sojourner, tra or foreigner in a, in a foreign land. And she seemed to be saying, this is what I thought she was saying, that we need to name our failures. And she wanted us to name our failures. Uh, that is the reason that our world fell apart. And remember, I was angry. I was angry at Jesus. Not because I don't have a million failures, I do. But because I thought that he was the reason my world fell apart. And so I didn't write Goshen or Pride or Messiah Complex. All which describe the old me in my workbook, I wrote Jesus. And just then Susan started writing. This happens to her. She started writing what she was hearing. Grabbed a pencil. She wrote something very personal to me that she heard from God. And then she wrote this. I'm calling you to walk in freedom. To free people. To be who you are supposed to be. Totally stripped of all, God has been allowed to clothe you. I will show you which way to go. You see, I think I built my world with a Messiah complex. But it fell apart because the Messiah has a Peter complex. And totally stripped of all, God has been allowed to clothe me. Clothe me with what? Himself. The Messiah. And believe me, he's only just, I think, barely started. I don't know. I'm not a good judge of this. But I don't feel very free. Or that I free many, if any. But if I ever do free any, it will be because I'm a little copper wire and God is love. Free love. He's grace. And grace is, is fire. Do you know why I believe in God? Thought about this a lot. I think it's primarily because of what I saw in my dad. It wasn't the fact that he had been to Princeton Seminary. It wasn't the fact that he pastored a church and knew his Bible. It was because of the fact that when he looked at me, sometimes his eyes would like just burn with, with love. And I began to believe that's not just him. And do you know why you believe? I think I know why you believe, if you believe. I doubt it was because you heard the right man with the right plan who employed all the right equipment. In fact, if that's why you believe, you may not believe in Christ. You, you may believe actually in an imitation Christ. But if you do believe, I bet it was because someone weakened by love looked at you, spoke to you, and related to you with love. I mean, you may have had the worst story, but maybe you just encountered it just a little bit, a little bit of love, free love, which is grace. And then you began to seek because you had already been found. When you love because you've been loved, you testify that there is such a thing as love and that love is free. And that free love is salvation. We've been saved by grace through faith and this not of ourselves. So, so anyway, what I was saying is, God has a Peter complex. And just as certainly God has a substitute your name here complex. 
Luke 20, Jesus says this to, he's speaking to Sadducees. He says, the dead are raised. In the passage about the bush, Moses calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, the Lord is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. All live to him. That's what Jesus just said. Why do all live to him? Well, because all are the Messiah's complex. Like a symphony of notes played on all the instruments in the orchestra. Or the one life lived by all the parts of a body harmonized by the Spirit of God. And so you see, we are the Messiah's complex. And how does he realize this complex? Well, he gets us to turn aside and, and see this. Here's the tree. It was on this tree that the God-man was crowned with thorns. Here's the tree, and here's the fire. He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. The spirit is in the blood. The fire is in the blood. Psalm 23, which the Israelites were commanded to recite together, and you all know because everybody stitches it, cross-stitches it on pillows and stuff. Psalm 23, verse 5a, the Lord has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So if you have enemies, this is the table that the Lord has prepared before you and before your enemy, one table. The Lord has prepared uh, a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He has anointed my head with oil. Now, this just occurred to me. I, like, I can't believe this just occurred to me. But just like a couple weeks ago, it occurred to me. Like, if I'm anointed, then I am what? Anointed. <laughs> in Hebrew, Mashiach. In English, Messiah. In Greek, Christos. So I'm just saying that we all have a Messiah complex. It is exactly what got the Messiah crucified. But the Messiah has a you complex. It's why he arranged for all of this to happen and then to rise from the dead. So this morning when you come to the table after you take the body and the blood, we have someone, unless you protest, someone that will just anoint you. Just drop an oil on your head. So confess your Messiah complex, then become the Messiah's complex, the body of Mashiach, the body of Christ. And every day do that. Every day come before him. Every, actually, every moment we're supposed to come before him and just say, I don't know which way to go. <laughs> but I'm trusting you to show me. Not a map, a presence. And then go wherever love goes. For love is the way to the promised land. Love is God. And God is a consuming fire. Amen. You know, a lot of times people will say to me, um, okay, but Peter, how do I do this? How do I do the Christian life? Well, here's an idea. If you read a little further on in Exodus, you'll find these 10 commandments. Do that, okay? Just take those and do that. But after, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, maybe a lifetime, you'll, you'll come back to me and you'll say, I'm having trouble with this. Uh, I really analyze it and I don't think I'm really able to do that when I understand all the parts of it. And then I could say, okay, well then read these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's a guy that did all the things on that list. Now do that. And you'll go off and you'll try to imitate that, walk on water, turn water and wine, all that kind of stuff. And then you'll come back after a while and you'll say, you know, this isn't going so well. The, this uh, trying to be the Messiah is not going so well. And then I say, well then just do this. Just sit in his presence. Now, you're just saying there's no place that I would rather be, but you were lying. Part of you was lying 
Because when you sit in his presence, just sit there, not say anything. And, and you, you know, I, people do this in different ways. Just say, God, would you be, just be aware that he, he's always there, but just be aware that he's right there. And, and then don't pretend. Don't, don't hide like we talked about last week. Just tell him how you feel. Tell, and something in you, something in you will say, get out of here. Now, that's your flesh because it gets burned up. That's your shame, your ego, your pride, your own self-will. But just sit in his presence and notice that you're still in his presence. The presence of Yah, Yahweh. And then you'll find that where you're sitting is somewhere inside of you in front of a veil. And you see the veil rips and he begins to lead you. Um, not as a map, but as a presence. The presence of love, the presence of life, the presence of truth. Um, the Logos of God. And just go where he tells you to go. And you'll have to keep coming back to this place over and over again because you still have a Messiah complex. And he has to convince you that you are his complex. And um, that's the gospel. So in other words, believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like prayer, Ted will be down front here and he'd love to pray with you.